Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Dust Science, and today I want to talk about the eigenvalues of orbital angular momentum in another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. We know that for any type of quantum angular momentum, the eigenvalues are quantized. We label the eigenvalues with the quantum numbers j and m, which can be integers or half integers. Today we're going to look at what happens to these quantum numbers in a very particular but very important case the orbital angular momentum associated with the motion of particles in three-dimensional space. Unsurprisingly, we will find that the results are consistent with those for the general angular momentum. But we will find out that there are additional constraints such that not all values of j and m are allowed for orbital angular momentum. So let's go. Let's start with a refresher of general angular momentum in quantum mechanics. Consider an operator J made of three components, J1, J2, and J3. If these three components obey these commutation relations, then we call J an angular momentum. And as a quick reminder, this is the levi civita symbol, and I'm using Einstein notation, so this expression implies a sum over the repeated indices K. As the angular momentum components don't commute, then they don't form a set of compatible observables. Instead, we define a new operator j squared, which is equal to j1 squared plus j2 squared plus j3 squared, that commutes with every angular momentum component. Given this result, in the theory of angular momentum, we define as our set of compatible observables the operators j squared and one of the other components, which is conventionally chosen to be j3. From the video on the eigenvalues of a general angular momentum, which you can find linked in the description, we know what the eigenvalue equations of j squared and j3 are. For j squared, we have this eigenvalue equation, where the eigenvalue is j times j plus 1 h bar squared, and j can take any of the values 0, 1 half, 1, 3 halves, 2, and so on in steps of 1 half. And for j3, we have this eigenvalue equation, where the eigenvalue is m h bar and m can take any of the values minus j, minus j plus 1, all the way to j minus 1 and j in steps of 1. The common eigenstates are labelled by j and m as shown here and here. These results only depend on the defining commutation relations for the general angular momentum up here. In this video we want to explore what happens when we consider the special case of orbital angular momentum. Orbital angular momentum is the angular momentum associated with the motion of particles that we are familiar with from classical mechanics. As a particular instance of an angular momentum, the properties of orbital angular momentum must be consistent with these general properties for a general angular momentum. However, what we will discover is that there are extra constraints associated with orbital angular momentum that mean, for example, that only a subset of the allowed values of J are actually possible for orbital angular momentum. So let's now turn to orbital angular momentum. Using the usual notation, we call the orbital angular momentum operator L, which is a vector operator made of three components, Lx, Ly, and Lz. These three components obey the general angular momentum commutation relations, which look like this for Lx, Ly, like this for Ly, Lz, and like this for Lz, Lx. We can straight away rewrite the eigenvalue equations for general angular momentum. For L squared we get this, and for Lz, this. Orbital angular momentum describes the motion of particles in the three-dimensional Euclidean space, so working with it is easiest if we use the position representation. As we know from the videos on the position representation, we need to project these equations onto the position basis, and this amounts to projecting the two sides of these two equations onto the basis states. On top of that, it is usually more convenient to work in terms of spherical coordinates, where positions are described by a distance r from the origin, by a polar angle theta, and by an azimuthal angle phi, that first requires projecting onto the horizontal plane and then measuring the angle from this axis. 
So let's start with the eigenstates Lm. The projection of the eigenstates gives the so-called wave function of the system, which I write as psi Lm of R. I am labeling the wave function with the same quantum numbers L and M to identify the corresponding eigenstate. And as we'll work in spherical coordinates, then we can write the vector R in terms of the corresponding coordinates. For the operators, we actually already derived all the relevant quantities in the position representation using spherical coordinates in the corresponding video that is linked in the description as always. The first operator is L squared. We found in that video that it is equal to minus h bar squared, then the partial derivative with respect to theta twice, then 1 over the tangent of theta multiplying the partial derivative with respect to theta, and then 1 over sine squared of theta multiplying the partial derivative of phi twice. The second operator is Lz, and it has a particularly simple form minus i h bar times the partial derivative with respect to phi. Okay, so with the result from the previous slide, we obtained these two eigenvalue equations in the position representation. In the first one, this is the L squared operator in the position representation and in spherical coordinates. This here is the corresponding eigenstate L m. When written in the position basis, we can still call this wave function an eigenstate, but most of the time we call it an eigenfunction to reflect the fact that in this position representation, quantum states are given by functions. This here is the eigenvalue, which stays unchanged, and this again the eigenfunction corresponding to the eigenstate Lm. In the second equation, we have the Lz operator. The two eigenfunctions here and here, both corresponding to the eigenstate Lm, and the eigenvalue mh bar. So the theory of orbital angular momentum amounts to solving these two differential equations to determine the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. In this video, we will look at the properties of the eigenvalues, and you can find the discussion on the eigenfunctions in the corresponding video that is also linked in the description. So what we have here are the eigenvalue equations for L squared and Lz written in the position representation. The first important thing to note is that the differential operators in both of these equations only depend on the angles theta and phi, but don't depend on r. This means that we can use a separable trial solution for psi, which is the product of a function that only depends on r, and then a function that only depends on the angular variables. The part that only depends on the angular variables is conventionally written with a capital Y, and with the label L as a subindex and the label M as a superindex. Plugging in this trial equation into the L squared equation here and here gives this very long expression. As the differential operators don't affect the R dependent part, we can move it before the operator and then it cancels with the corresponding part on the right-hand side. This means that we can rewrite the eigenvalue equation for L squared like this, and following the same procedure with the eigenvalue equation for Lz, we find this second equation for Ylm. These equations imply that the Ylm are the common eigenfunctions of L squared and Lz. If we look again at the full wave function psi up here, then we see that the eigenvalue equations for L squared and Lz only tell us about the angular part but don't tell us about the radial part. That means that any radial function f would be consistent with the angular momentum eigenvalue equations, so the angular momentum operators are not enough to fully specify the quantum state psi of the system. In turn, this means that although L squared and Lz form a set of compatible observables, they don't form a complete set of commuting observables. And I emphasize the word complete here. To fully specify a quantum state, we need additional operators beyond the angular momentum operators. We're not going to worry about this for now, because the aim of the videos on angular momentum is to learn about these specific operators.
However, when we use them to solve specific problems, then we will need to combine them with additional operators. You can find a very good example of this in our videos on the hydrogen atom, where we need to add the operator associated with the total energy of the system, called the Hamiltonian, to the two angular momentum operators to define a complete set of commuting observables to be able to fully specify the quantum states of the hydrogen atom. Right, so we are now ready to discuss the allowed eigenvalues of orbital angular momentum. As we'll see, it turns out that for this we only need the equation for Lz. The key point is that in this equation, the differential operator only depends on phi. This means that we can use a separable trial solution for y, which is the product of a function that only depends on theta, and then a function that only depends on phi. Plugging in this trial solution into the Lz equation here and here gives this. As the differential operator doesn't affect the theta dependent part, we can move it to the other side, and then it cancels with the corresponding part on the right hand side. We can also cancel the h bars, and overall, this means that the eigenvalue equation for Lz only affects the phi part of the wave function, and we can rewrite it like this. This is now a differential equation for the function g of a single variable phi. It has the standard form df by dx equal to alpha f of x for constant alpha, which can be solved by separation of variables. We can then integrate both sides, and we get the logarithm of f as equal to alpha x plus an integration constant a. Exponentiating gives f of x equal to a times e to the power alpha x, where a is a constant. Using this solution for our equation, we find that glm of phi is equal to some constant a times e to the power i n phi. We can therefore write the angular momentum eigenfunction y as equal to f times e to the i m phi where I have absorbed the normalization constant into f. We're now ready for the final step in figuring out the allowed values of L and M. Let's start writing again the latest expression we got for the wave function. The wave function must be continuous for these equations to be obeyed. For example, if the phi dependent part was not continuous, then acting with the derivative here, would produce a delta function, which would then be incompatible with the right-hand side. So let's enforce continuity along the phi coordinate. We know that the azimuthal angle phi is defined between 0 and 2 pi, and this means that the eigenfunction at 0 must be equal to the eigenfunction at 2 pi. Plugging in the expression that we just got for the eigenfunction, we get this. The f's cancel, so we end up with e to the i 2 pi m equal to 1. The only solution to this equation is for integer m, which means that for orbital angular momentum, m must be an integer. As m is given by this list of values, then if m is an integer, this means that l must also be an integer. So what does this mean? In the videos on general angular momentum, we figured out that for j squared, the eigenvalues take this form, and they're labelled by the number j, which can be any of 0, 1 half, 1 3 halves, 2, and so on. And in a similar way, we figured out that for j3, the eigenvalues take this form, where m can be any of the values in this list. So for a general angular momentum, j and m can be either integer or half integer. Now for orbital angular momentum, we have L squared with the corresponding eigenvalues, and Lz with the corresponding eigenvalues. But now in the special case of orbital angular momentum, the only allowed values of L are integer, and the only allowed values of m are also integer. <laughs> 
This result for orbital angular momentum is consistent with the result for general angular momentum, but it has a stricter constraint on the allowed eigenvalues L and M because half integer values are not possible. So, right, so this is it for the eigenvalues of orbital angular momentum. However, before we conclude, let's have a quick final discussion. We know from the general theory of angular momentum that half integer values for J are possible, but we just figured out that they don't exist for orbital angular momentum. So a question that you may have now is whether half integer angular momentum eigenvalues really exist at all. And the answer is, it turns out that for spin angular momentum, half integer values do exist. If you want to learn more about this, a good starting point would be to check out our videos on spin. Orbital angular momentum exhibits quantized eigenvalues, as all angular momenta must. However, the eigenvalues that are allowed for orbital angular momentum are only a fraction of those that are possible for general angular momenta. You can learn more about other possibilities in our videos about spin. And now that we know all there is to know about the eigenvalues, I encourage you to check out the video on the eigenfunctions of orbital angular momentum. And as always, if you liked the video, please subscribe.